Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Clean Water webinar series. We're really excited to be able to offer these webinars to you, especially to those of you who are interested in becoming Save Our Streams monitors. I'm Rebecca Shore, the Mid-Atlantic Save Our Streams coordinator. This presentation today is our macroinvertebrate introduction, which will introduce you to the tiny critters that we collect and identify as Save Our Streams monitors. We use these bugs to then calculate stream health scores. This presentation also serves as the first step in our Save Our Streams training. Some of you I know were signed up to attend one of our training events this spring that had to be postponed, and this presentation is actually the first step in the certification process. I have a few quick housekeeping items to review before I turn things over to Zach. The first thing is that this webinar is being recorded and it'll be available on the Isaac Walton Lee YouTube channel in the next few days. Second, this presentation is meant to be interactive. So if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, you can type them in and send them from the GoToWebinar questions panel. I'm going to be keeping an eye on the questions as they come in and I'll read them aloud to, aloud to Zach so he can answer them live throughout the presentation. This presentation should run about an hour and 15 minutes, um, depending on how many questions we get. So if you need to leave early, don't worry. You can always view the rest in the recording. And you'll be receiving both um, a link to the recording as well as follow-up information about the training process itself in the follow-up email, which you should get tomorrow or the day after. All right. So with I'll turn things over to Zach Moss, who is our Save Our Streams coordinator for the Midwest, and he's going to walk you through our macroinvertebrates. That's right. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, yeah, like Rebecca mentioned, uh, my name is Zach Moss. I may or may not have met some of you that are watching. Um, either way, thanks for joining us today. And I am in Iowa right now when we have 25 mile an hour winds. So if you hear some banging around, um, it's just my building being assaulted with debris. So disregard that. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> I don't know uh, how familiar everybody watching might be with the Save Our Streams program, um, but what we are is a citizen science uh, volunteer water quality monitoring program. And one of the ways that we and our volunteers monitor water quality is to um, catch macroinvertebrates out of streams and identify them uh, and give the give that stream a stream health score based on the different kinds of bugs that they're finding. So this slide show is just going to give you guys a little bit of an intro to how to identify these macroinvertebrates, um, which is uh, a, a presentation that we would give in the in-person training if we were able to hold those right now. And I also apologize, my presentation is pulled up over here, so I'll try to look back and forth at the camera, but uh, if I'm looking over here, that's what's going on. So to start out, um, this is some of the stuff we're going to go over. Um, we're just going to just introduce what is a benthic macroinvertebrate. If you're not familiar with that term, um, give you some tools and tips to um, help you be able to identify these bugs. And then we're going to go through our whole list of macroinvertebrates that we use in our uh, protocol and help you learn how to identify each specific one. And then we'll follow up at the end with some of the lookalikes and mistaken identities. You'll notice uh, as I go through that some of them look pretty similar to each other. And if you haven't monitored before or haven't seen these bugs uh, very often, then it's pretty easy to get them mixed up. And then lastly, we'll just uh, conclude with what can you do at home um, if you're interested in following through and trying to get certified, uh, how do we do that? So I'll cover that stuff at the end. So to start out, um, what is a benthic macroinvertebrate? So you break it down into the different parts of the term. Aquatic, uh, they live in water. They are large enough that you can see with your eye. Um, oftentimes we use like little hand lenses, uh, but you don't need a microscope or anything crazy like that. Um, and invertebrate means they have no backbone. And benthic means they live on the bottom. So you might be familiar with like water striders and whirligig beetles and some other bugs that live on the water on the surface or within the water column but we're just looking specifically at things that you would find in the mud or under rocks on the bottom of the stream and you guys are not in this alone you don't have to rely just on your memories luckily there are 
a lot of different tools out there to help with uh, the identification. We have resources on our website. You can get these, uh, order this online. Um, we've got some, some different keys that you can walk, walk through step-by-step step, as well as some apps um, that can help you with the identification in the field. And you don't have to be a bug expert uh, to do this by any means. We just, we just identify down to the class order or family. Uh, we don't go all the way down to the species because um, I am not an entomologist and I'm guessing most of you are not as well. And when we, uh, when we go through and do the process of the identification, um, then we have the bugs broken up into three different categories here. And this is just a, a clip of our data sheet. So uh, some of the bugs will be sensitive to pollution, meaning if the water is polluted, you probably won't find these. Some of them will be less sensitive to pollution and some will be uh, pretty tolerant. So uh, you could have some pretty nasty water and still find these bugs, but uh, you could also have really good water and still find these. So really, uh, you should be alarmed if you're not finding the good bugs or if you're not finding a lot of different kinds of bugs. Uh, Save Our Streams looks for diversity in our, in our bug populations. We also have options to uh, use your phone to help out. A lot of people carry their phones in their pockets all the time. So uh, we, we partnered with the Audubon Naturalist Society on this Creek Critters app. And you can download that. It just walks you through step by step uh, the whole collection process as well as the identification. Um, and then you can even post some of your results on, the, on their map afterwards. And so this would be something you can do without any training. You can go out with kids or your family and um, it wouldn't necessarily be Save Our Streams certified, but it's just another way to get some practice with bugs. And then Aquabugs was made by the Isaac Walton League, and that's specifically for Save Our Streams and will help identify these bugs, <clears throat> these bugs that I talk about today. Um, Rebecca, do we have any questions at this point? No questions so far. Cool. I'll be trying to pause throughout uh, the presentation after different sections. And so uh, ask your questions during it and I'll try to try to address those when they come up. So uh, to start identifying, you have to first know the different parts of bugs. Um, we have a head, thorax and abdomen. Um, we're probably all pretty familiar with what a head is, but thorax is just the middle part and then abdomen would be the, the bottom part or the butt, if you want to call it that. And a lot of our bugs will have, or some of our bugs might have gills and they just look like little feathery um, body parts. You can see them here on the side of this mayfly. Um, and those help to collect oxygen out of the water. Some of the bugs might have tail filaments and uh, wing pads. And then we also have these little, uh, these little things called pro legs, which aren't necessarily true legs, um, but they are sort of a little appendage that can help identify. So. Just uh, keep in mind some of these different terms because I'll be referring back to a lot of them. So with that, I'm going to hop into our first uh, category of bugs, pollution sensitive. And our first one will be the stonefly. Stonefly has three pairs of legs and no gills on its abdomen. You notice on the abdomen here that doesn't have those little feathery attachments on its on its abdomen. So a stonefly will be smooth and they usually will have two tails, but uh, we caution against using going just off the tails for identification because sometimes uh, when you're <clears throat> a bug in the water, you might get bitten or you might get pinched between some rocks or something and um, they might be able to, they might lose those tails for one reason or another. So we try to use multiple different ways to identify bugs to confirm their identity. And these guys, you can't see it in this picture. You can see it in this one. They will also have a lot of times hairy little armpits. And so while they don't have the hair, the, the gills along the abdomen, they oftentimes have these hairy armpits. And so a lot of the bugs I also failed to mention, a lot of the bugs we're looking at are in their larva stages. So they live in the water as babies, essentially, <clears throat> and then they mature and uh, climb out on land as adults. And so this would be what an adult stonefly looks like. And sometimes you can see these guys doing push-ups in the water, um, trying to get the, 
the little armpit hairs, which are actually gills to get more oxygen. Um, they're just moving around trying to get more water through those gills. Our next one would be a caddisfly. And we have two different types of caddisflies. So um, just pay attention to this one for now, but later I'll be talking about net spinning caddisflies. So these guys are pollution sensitive. They again also have three pairs of legs, but you can tell they look a little bit different. They don't have the wing flaps and um, their head is shaped differently than the stonefly. Sometimes they'll have cases. If you've seen these before, they have, uh, they'll take stuff from the environment, rocks and twigs and stuff and make a case that they can crawl around in. Um, and they also don't have the antenna sticking off Sometimes they can have gills on the bottom side, but um, sometimes they'll also be smooth. So, uh, but one thing to, to really take note of is they have this hard looking head, but the rest of their body will be soft. And here's what some of those cases might look like. Um, this guy looks like they used vegetation and this one used rocks. And so they live in those and then they use their legs to pull themselves around while the case protects their abdomen. And here's another look at what that might look like connected to a rock in a stream. And there's just a bunch of fun facts. I'm probably going to skip over some of these slides to keep it moving. But keeping with the pollution sensitive trend is a water penny. These guys are pretty unique. Um, they don't look like most other bugs. <clears throat> they're kind of beetle like, but they're very easy to identify by their sort of circular shape here. And, um, it's hard to tell, but on their bottom side, they do actually have legs. But a lot of times you'll just see their top side like this um, stuck to a rock. And so it'll look, if you, if you have them on a rock or if you have it on a table, it'll just be kind of a little raised bump. Um, they're really small. Oh, my bad. They're really small. They can be up to a half an inch. Um, can be kind of easy to miss. So that's why we want to make sure we're taking our time and um, maybe take a hand lens out with you if you're trying to identify these guys. And a riffle beetle, this this one is interesting because it has both, both the larva and the adult stage are considered benthic macroinvertebrates that we look for and count in our Save Our Streams protocol. So there are several other kinds of beetles or beetle-like bugs that might live in the water, but a lot of those are up on the surface or <clears throat> within the water column. Um, these uh, adult riffle beetles stay on the bottom and crawl along rocks in the bottom of the stream. And as their name would imply, they're often found in riffles, which are well oxygenated and really rocky and pretty shallow. And you can see this, are, these are some pretty good pictures of the larva. Um, you can see they're dark brown and they look kind of, I always say, I think they look kind of crunchy. They have these, uh, hard plates on their whole body. So here's just a little drawing to help point out some of the different features. These guys again will have three legs. And if you remember the caddis fly that was uh, two, two slides ago, um, they had the hard head and soft body. Riffle beetles will have a hard body and they're kind of striped because uh, it looks like a raccoon tail almost. But they've just got a really characteristic comma shape as you can see here, and these little hairs at the bottom of their abdomen. Then the beetles um, are kind of what you think of when you think of a beetle, but uh, change your, your perspective because a lot of times, I don't know if you're familiar with like June beetles are real big. If you look here, these guys are really small. Um, so they'll look just like uh, <clears throat> the head of a pin maybe crawling around after you take them out of the water. But they're, they're really dark, um, have the six legs, obviously, in the hard body. And mayflies, some of you might be familiar with mayflies, especially uh, fly fishers and um, anyone who lives near a river that's ever had a mayfly hatch. <clears throat> you can see the pretty easily identifiable gills on the abdomen here. It's a little bit harder to see in this picture because it's up against this uh, sand colored rock, but this guy also has gills along the abdomen. And oftentimes, if you remember, the stonefly had two tails. 
oftentimes mayflies will have three and sometimes they will have two um, so that's just another reason we don't like to rely just on the tails to to identify and then you know they can lose some of those tails if they get in an accident or something or um, get in a fight but these guys have these i think they have some pretty powerful looking arms they they sit kind of kind of close to the ground and um they they wait for their food to walk by or I guess float by or swim by these are just a few different um variations of mayflies so you can see like this one here <clears throat> has two tails but they've all got these gills along the abdomen sometimes they're a little bit harder to see um, so that's why we really have to make sure we take our time and and make sure we're identifying uh, multiple different parts of their body and you might be familiar like i mentioned with the adults if you've ever witnessed a hatch um, they come out in swarms and it's pretty crazy uh, to see and they'll pile up in in uh, little piles of dead mayflies because they only they hatch and they only live for one day and so uh, they fly around in huge quantities and they then they die and gather in huge quantities so it's really pretty amazing there's a little bit of humor because like i mentioned they hatch and fly around for only one day so this guy's watching day of our lives another one of our pollution sensitive bugs would be the water snipe and these guys have kind of a soft uh, worm-like body almost <clears throat> they can be pale to green uh, you can really see that that coloration here in this picture and then you can identify them from some of the other lookalikes by these two feathery horns or tufts or whatever you want to call these at the end uh, as well as they have these little suction suction cup like legs that stick off the bottom of the body and these guys again um, it's hard to tell in a lot of these pictures but um, all these are blown up so you can see their features but they're going to be pretty small and we have uh, a chart on the web our iwla.org website that i'll point you to a little bit later and it shows the different size variations um, side by side for the different bugs another pollution sensitive bug that we look at we call this a bug but a macroinvertebrate that we look at is the gilled snail so it's just kind of um, your typical what you think of when you think of a snail <clears throat> got this kind of cone shaped shell and spirally and the easiest way to identify this because there's going to be another kind of snail later um, and it's different than this and so the difference between the two if you hold it up with the opening of the shell facing towards you and the point facing up guild snails opening will be on the right and I'll show you a lung snail later where the opening will be on the left. So lung snail, left, guild snail, right. Zach, we did have a question about sort of life cycle and how long these bugs live. So mayflies, you know, they might live for less than 24 hours as an adult, but do we know, I mean, it varies across different larvae, but how long they live in the larval form? Not just maybe, but is there a range amongst these different macros? Yeah, um, you know, I'm not sure I know the answer to that one. Um, different bugs have different lifespans. Mm -hmm. um, so, unfortunately, I don't. Do you know the answer, <laughs> Rebecca? I do. Uh, okay. So, it depends exactly on some of them. So, some of the bugs, like uh, you'll find out about helgramites in a little bit, they can live two to four years of larvae in the water before they even become adults and mayflies can live um one to two years as larvae so it's pretty interesting some of them have most of their life is spent in the water some of them it's some of their lives um but yeah they can live you know a few months to several several years in the water so it's a pretty, it's an important time of their life cycle which is why they're a good thing to measure for stream health yeah yeah, I think maybe a lot of people might be familiar with like caterpillars, which are the larval form of butterflies. Um, and those those grow up pretty quickly. But then you have other things like 17 year cicadas, which live in the ground as larvae for 17 years, like their name implies. Um, so it's just kind of interesting the the variations you can have between the different bugs. 
Did we have any other questions, Rebecca, for the sensitive bugs yet? Um, that's all I have for now. So definitely feel free to send those ones in. And even if you have questions that are more, more like sort of general interest uh, macro questions, feel free to send those. We love talking. Yep. About awesome. So we'll move on to less sensitive. Um, this is our middle um, category in that, uh, that chart I showed you earlier. So Rebecca just mentioned these guys, Dobson flies. <clears throat> they can also be called Helgramites. And these are pretty gnarly looking guys. You can see, see their mouth parts here. They can bite you. So, so just keep that in mind if you, uh, if you find them. They're cool to see, but uh, maybe be careful if you're handling them. And you can really see in this picture well here, um, these gill tufts along their abdomen. They have these long appendages, which actually aren't gills, but underneath or right next to them, they'll also have these gill tufts. So here's a nice drawing of, uh, of a Dobson fly. And they'll have three pairs of legs. The rest of these are just appendages. They're not actually legs. Um, and pretty easily identifiable by these big jaws. Like the presentation says, be careful. And they'll have eight of those appendages with the little cotton-like armpit hairs underneath, which help them get oxygen out of their water. And something that's pretty different from some of the other ones we've looked at so far is these guys can get pretty big. Um, you know, they can they can be really tiny like this, but they can, you know, they can get pretty big too. And so the bigger they get, the more they hurt when they bite. And here's what this guy looks like as an adult. You can see uh, those big jaw parts. And we have two Dobson fly lookalikes. The first one that we'll talk about is a fish fly. Um, like I mentioned, it looks yeah. really similar. It's got, yep. <laughs> Sorry. So we had a few questions come in um, just real quick. Um, I apologize. They no worries. As I expected that they would. So we actually have one from a little bit um, back about caddisflies. Apologies for missing that earlier. So with caddisflies, um, we had Jim asking, do they use any materials to make their cases or do certain species use certain materials? I think, no, I can't say this for a fact, but I think that uh, they just use what's in their habitat that they're in at the moment. Yeah, there are some. You can distinguish the species, well, maybe not species level, but at least genus level based on the shape um, of the case themselves. So some make like a spiral shape, um, some make, you know, just a straight tube. And yeah, it can depend on both what's available, but some of them do seem to prefer, like, they'll use bark instead of rocks. Um, but of course, the size of the rocks and stones available makes a difference. Yeah. Um, and then we just started two general questions that I wanted to get to. One was, do most of these bugs exist in a large geographic area? Uh, yeah, so this is a Save Our Streams is a nationwide, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a nationwide program. So uh, we've got people doing Save Our Streams in Maryland and New York, Iowa, and you know California and Oregon. So uh, that's again why we don't go down to the species level because there will be variations there. But um, in these higher higher levels, um, yeah, they can be found across the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with um, I think for. A lot of folks, especially if you're not uh, super familiar with the bug world, you know, you think about species of animals like um, if you're looking at a gray squirrel versus, um, you know, a ground squirrel or other kinds of species. With bugs, it's a lot harder to distinguish between species. It requires really high power microscopes. And for some bugs, you can only get to the genus level. So that's why, yeah, we're looking at just the order level, even of these bugs um rather than going down to genus or species yeah and there's actually we even have some groups that we interact with on social media like there's a group from australia and they have the same order of bugs so they'll be like oh we found these you know mayflies and we know they're not the same species but it's pretty cool um they're all around and yeah macroinvertebrates.org has a ton of uh 
vertebrate info if you want to get a little even deeper than this into it. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll put that link in the chat as well for folks so they can see. And then um, I'll, I'll do one more question and then I'll let you move on for a little bit. So um, Amber was asking, now this is a question and it's a little, it's hard to get a specific answer, but why are some bugs more pollution sensitive than others? Yeah, um, a big thing would be their oxygen requirements. Um, that's pretty common. Um, so some of these more sensitive bugs, they require more oxygen in the water. Um, and a lot of the less sensitive like leeches and um, crayfish and things like that will not require as much oxygen. And we use that to, as one indicator of water quality because that same oxygen that sustains the bugs um, can also sustain fish uh, and other things that live in the water. And we also have issues like sedimentation and flooding, which other animals are just more resilient to. You know, think of maybe like a, a raccoon versus a panda. Um, a raccoon, <laughs> <laughs> a raccoon can live in the forest, um, or it can live in a dumpster in the city. Uh, and then you look at pandas, which have really specific requirements. They require big habitats and certain kind of plants there. And so, uh, if their habitat gets degraded, they're not going to be able to survive. So it's kind of similar, similar idea with some of these bugs. Awesome. And um, someone just sent in, Laura sent in a, a great resource about a video of case building caddisflies that I'll put in the chat as well. Definitely, um, there's lots of great videos on YouTube as well to be able to see these bugs in action. It's a little tough, you know, doing a presentation over a webinar for us to share videos. So um, we'll definitely share some of those in the chat as well, because there's <laughs> it's one thing to look at these bugs as a drawing and it's another to see them in the field and see them wiggling around. Yeah. Yeah, that just reminded me, um, I've heard of artists that actually utilize caddisflies and they put different uh, stones and, and pretty things in a in the water and they have the caddisflies make a case and they make jewelry out of that. Just kind of a fun little fact. Yeah, I've looked at some of those. It's, uh, <laughs> it's definitely a niche market, but I like it. <laughs> Yeah, necklace pendant made of caddisfly turquoise. Great. And someone, uh, Richard did ask while you just navigate back to your slide, he asked about the sizes of specimens varying over seasonal development. And there are definitely, so as um, bugs grow over time as larvae, they will increase in size um, for the most part. So that's how a lot of people can distinguish like fourth year Helgramite, they'll call it, versus a first year Helgramite is purely size. And then also because these are invertebrates, they molt as they grow. So sometimes there's also some changes, some more subtle changes in their body structures, they get bigger. But for the most part, these are the, these are sort of things, this is the way they'll look um, as larval forms, though um, they will get bigger over time for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And then there's also a range between the different species. So one mayfly species might be a little bit bigger than another mayfly species or you know, similarly with other bugs. All right, so we had the Dobson fly. He's got these appendages with the the hair tufts or the, the gill tufts under the appendages on its abdomen. And its first lookalike will be the fish fly. <clears throat> you can see it's got the it's got the big jaws and uh, similar appendages, but it doesn't have the little gill tufts under the appendages. You can see here it's just kind of little wiry looking appendages sticking off and they don't have those nice fluffy gill tufts hanging off. And they'll have eight pairs of appendages and you can also see they have these short little uh, fleshy tails on their on the end of their abdomen which can help set them apart as well. But they'll be similar size to the Dobson fly um, so make sure you just really look for those gill tufts and look for presence or absence of those tails also. And then our third lookalike with these guys is an alder fly. They've also got a pretty big jaw here. Um, and they only have seven pairs of appendages, uh, whereas the other had eight. And they also don't have gill tufts. So um, seven pairs of, append of appendages, no gill tufts, but they've got this nice uh, fluffy tail, which has gills on it as well. So that's um, much different than the other two you can see. Just looking at the tails at, at the bottom of the abdomen, 
that this guy is not fluffy and this guy's really fluffy and it's also got a pretty tapered abdomen and they're going to be considerably smaller than the other ones although there are dobs and flies and uh, fish flies that are going to be that could be an inch and a half as well and many of you are probably familiar with crayfish or crawdads or crawfish or um, whatever you call them based on where you're from or how you grew up and they just look like little lobsters they're really easily identifiable um, there's not much else that you're going to find in the freshwater streams that looks like them and they can be you know as babies they can be really small or they can get to be the size of your hand as well so a pretty big variation on size with these guys but nothing else really has those big uh, claws on their on their front hands Right, we've had a couple of questions come in. Uh, yep. Now that I've got the, the questions pane working, it's uh, coming in well. So, um, so Heather had a, a sort of general question about larvae, which is, are their diets um, the same at different stages of their lives? And um, for the most part, so these bugs are sort of set in their behaviors. So some of them are scavengers. I think there's scrapers. Uh, I'm trying to remember all the words. Uh, predators. Predators. Yep, yep. So they all have, they basically stick with their diet. And the way it changes for the most part is just the size of what they eat. As they get bigger, they can eat bigger things. Um, <clears throat> yeah, some of the some of the larvae will be predatory. Um, and they'll actually go out and seek out other bugs and eat them. Um, some of them just kind of try to stick to a rock and they catch whatever whatever floats by in the river um, but yeah they'll they'll stay basically the same throughout their life until they mm -hmm. um, turn into adults and obviously they're not going to be filtering stuff out of the water when they live on land mm -hmm. and related to that a question just came in from angela what are some of the consumers or what are some some of the animals that eat these macros so we'll go over the dobson fly and dragonfly and those are two big predatory ones um, and then crayfish are also predatory. They'll actually even eat fish, um, small fish, but dobson flies, damselflies, dragonflies. I believe the mayfly and stonefly also um, can. But, yeah, so some of the macros eat each other. <laughs> and then yeah. in terms of bigger animals, I mean, especially fish. So I don't know if there's any trout or other fishermen on the call, but they're all you know fish depend on these macros it's sort of their kind of bread and butter for what they eat and that's a lot of fly fishermen actually are experts at macros as well because that's how they tie their flies down so they'll be able to make flies that look like uh caddis flies and different things like that so the the macros are also important because they're kind of the the uh, thing that everything else eats <laughs> in the stream so fish and of course bigger macros you know like otters would eat crayfish or things like that herons so they're sort of the, the backbone of the ecosystem someone's got to do it someone's got to be it uh, and we had a question from richard and i believe this is with regards specifically to the alder fly but um also a good sort of general id question which is that the appendages can often look like gill tufts so like those fleshy appendages um, on the back of the alder fly there. How can you distinguish between what's an appendage and what's a gill? What are some tips you might have? Um, well, I definitely recommend a hand lens <clears throat> or they even have little um, field microscopes that aren't, they're not as powerful as lab microscopes because we don't need it to be that powerful to look at these bugs. Um, but get them under a lens and look a little bit closer. The, Gill tufts are going to be really feathery. You can kind of compare it to like the feathery look on the tail here. Um, it's hard to tell in this picture, but these are just kind of meaty almost, I would say. They look kind of like legs, non-functional legs. But if you can zoom in or look up close, you can see that it's feathery and they might be kind of pulsing or trying to move, trying to get more water, um, more oxygen through the gills. Awesome. On to sow bugs? On to sow bugs. All right. Sow bugs. Um, 
look really similar to roly polies that you might find under a rock. And so a lot of people will probably be familiar with this um, kind of shape and color and um, pattern that these guys have. But they're gonna be oval shaped. They're gonna have legs um, all along their body. As you can see in the, the diagram and the pictures, <clears throat> they're gonna be dark brown or gray um, and usually under an inch. So these guys are uh, they're relatively uh, the only, pretty much the only ones that look like this. It's, it'll be hard to get them confused. There will be another one a little, <clears throat> a little bit later on that might look similar, but I'll help you tell them apart. Oh, and here it is. Here's the scud. A scud will be a lot smaller. If you remember, the sow bug is, I think it's set up to three fourths or up to an inch. This guy will be an eighth to a quarter of an inch. So that's pretty tiny. Um, and they'll be really identifiable because they look like, you know, they have multiple legs along their body. They have kind of a hard shell on their back, um, but they swim on their side. So if you can get them in the water, even if you know if you have it spread out, if you have the bugs out on a table or in a container, um, and just in a little bit of water, even you can see them. They swim sideways, kind of like this, rather than like this. So you can see this guy's got his side facing up, and that's a really really easy way to tell them tell them apart. But they look like a little shrimp, and they swim on their side. And oftentimes, if you find one, you're gonna find a lot more along with it, and so. Um, They'll just kind of be wiggling around, swimming on their sides. Yeah, like it says here, they can be very abundant. And one sample found 10,000 scuds per square meter in Virginia. So, and damselflies. Many of you have probably seen these guys flying around um, when you've been out hanging out by the water in their adult form. But these guys are one of the predators. They've got these big eyes, which they retain as adults. And they also have these long legs. They kind of, you can see in this picture here on the rock, they kind of sit in, the, in a push-up position almost, and they have to be up and, and able to catch their prey. And they have three tails, and they're kind of paddle-shaped like this. They're, they're not hairy like some of the other ones, or, um, or thin and, and wiry like some of the other ones. They're kind of paddle-shaped, and so that's, uh, pretty easy way to tell them apart from some of the others. But like many of them, they'll have three legs. Uh, they don't have gills along their um, along their abdomen. And they've got these big eyes, and you'll see that they have a, a mouth part down here that helps them catch uh, catch their prey. And again, a big, big way to tell them, identify them is their paddle-like tails. And they're also going to be longer and skinnier um, than some of the other, like, stoneflies and mayflies. Uh, in general. So this is what they look like as adults. You've probably seen different uh, damselfly species around. They look like little dragonflies with thin abdomens. We had a question come in about damselfly larvae, uh, yep. which was how long do they remain as larvae? And the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, but they it ranges between the different species. So some of them only a few months. Um, some of them can live up to three years, actually, in this sort of nymph larval stage. So again, if you look at the size, you might not be able to say exactly how many months it is, but they're, they start off really teeny tiny, they grow bigger, and when they're at their biggest, that's usually when they're getting close to molt. But yeah, a lot of these bugs, there's a lot of variety. So some of them can live quite a long time. And then even um, damselflies and dragonflies as adults can live varying amounts of times. There are some dragonflies that actually migrate um, and forth. So it's um, some of them can li definitely live quite a long time. Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunately <clears throat> one of the parts about um, making it easier to identify them for uh, citizen scientists is that we don't get down into a lot of that nitty gritty. Um, but there are a ton of resources out there if you are really interested in a specific species that you found, like that macroinvertebrates.org, or there are other resources you can find online that can help you learn more about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we also had a question about, do damselflies eat mosquitoes? 
And I think that, well, so for dandelions and dragonflies as adults, I mean, they basically eat kind of anything. <laughs> yeah, so they definitely, they'll eat, I mean, I've seen dragonflies eating moth. So I think if it's flying and it's, you know, small enough that they can eat, they definitely will eat it. They'll eat mosquitoes, um, yeah. other sort of bugs flitting around. And just a reminder to folks, if you um, have any other questions, type them in um, to the questions pane and send them in. So um, be sure to just type those in and we'll keep answering them as we go along. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. So another one of our wormy looking guys is the crane fly. It uh, looks a little similar to the water snipe, but there are some pretty characteristic differences. Um, so it's again going to be plump and caterpillar-like or worm-like, whatever you want to compare it to. And it's got these little uh, appendages at the end. But these guys can be, oftentimes they'll be kind of see-through almost or translucent. You can see a line of their digestive system, which is might be cool, might be gross depending on who you are, but um, that's kind of characteristic of these guys a lot of times, and they don't have the legs that the water snipe had. So if you remember, the water snipe had like the long, long-ish um, suction cup legs sticking off the bottom. These guys just look like caterpillars. And here's what they look like as adults. Um, kind of crazy that this chunky little crane fly larva turns into the skinny adult, but um, they look like big mosquitoes. They are not big mosquitoes, so you don't need to kill them if you see them. They actually eat mosquitoes. And dragonflies, I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with adult dragonflies, but in their larva stage or their nymph stage, they look similar to these. Um, they're again like the damselflies, they have these big eyes. You can see here, especially these big eyes on their head. And they're predatory as well, so you, you might see them chasing other bugs if you're keeping your bugs in the same container. Um, that's why we usually try to separate them out in an ice cube tray or something like that. But they've got this scoop-like lower lip, um, kind of an oval or round abdomen. Sometimes I've e even seen them more like diamond-shaped almost, where there's like a it comes out to almost a point on the end. But these guys are, are pretty easily uh, identifiable. They don't have the long, they don't have any long tails or anything like that, but they're gonna be, in general, they're gonna be bigger than some of the other um, uh, fly, fly larva and nymphs, so. Then there's obviously a dragonfly adult zooming around and scooping up mosquitoes out of the air. And Zach, how do you tell the difference between an adult damselfly and dragonfly? Um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but the dragonflies land with their wings out and damselflies land with their wings up. Yep. And in general, dragonflies are going to be um, bigger and noisier than the damselflies. Yes, indeed. So if you remember earlier, I said there would be another kind of caddisfly we'd talk about. So. Earlier, we talked about the caddisfly or the casemaker caddisfly. This is the common net spinning caddisfly, and it's in a less pollution sensitive category. And what you'll look for on these guys, if you remember the other ones had a hard head, hardish head, and then a soft body, these guys will have a hard head and just three hard plates um, on the abdomen. So kind of corresponding with each of the legs, there'll just be three hard plates and then the rest of the body will be soft. And I'll, I'll go over, like I mentioned, I'll go over the look likes again at the end side by side so we can talk about some of those things. But oftentimes they'll have the, these gill tufts on the underside of them. They'll be kind of comma shaped, but they'll probably be wiggling around if you, if you get them out in person and um, have them in the water, they're gonna be moving around. So they're obviously not gonna just stay curled up like this. They don't have antenna. Um, they have, like I mentioned, three legs, and they're gonna have these little uh, extensions at the end of their abdomen that uh, also help set them apart. So here's a nice picture. You can see the head 
and then the three armored plates right here uh, corresponding to their legs and then the rest of the body is just kind of soft and you can see the gill tufts on the abdomen and these little tufts on the end as well and then they turn into these guys as adults clams and mussels um they're uh pretty much the only thing that's going to look like this but you know they've got two shells uh, kind of oval shaped or round and the shells open up or you can i don't know call it one shell but opens up and it's got the soft body inside and if you find them don't open them because it's not going to be good for it you can you can identify it as a clam or a mussel just by looking at the shell We have any questions at the moment, Rebecca? Um, I don't think we've had any more come in. I did want to, so especially when you said about, you know, don't open them up because um, you can hurt them. But so something else with saber streams is we don't, is them, you know, we wouldn't count empty muscle shells. So we would only yeah. something if it's alive. And so a lot of folks will ask you know, if you find, parts <laughs> if you find a piece of a bug um you know we only count bugs if they are alive or if they are sort of fully intact um and dead and that's because you know we can so uh, be a little traumatic for bugs if we, when we're collecting them but if you have you know a decayed you know shell or an old shell of a snail we wouldn't count that um towards our data yeah <clears throat> and also on that note, um, what we what we try to teach is uh, try to get good at doing this identification um, so you don't have to have the bugs out of the moving water for longer than you need because as they're out of the water, especially the pollution sensitive bugs, um, they're gonna they could potentially start dying if you if you have them out of their habitat for too long. So you can try to get them back in the water as quickly as possible after ID IDing them. And then we also uh, recommend uh, bringing along a little spray bottle and you can spray the bugs and keep them wet and um, do that as well. But try to return them to the stream alive if at all possible. In different states, yeah. some have, uh, you might, your state might require a permit. I know Maryland uh, requires you to have a permit, um, but it differs by state. So maybe check with your DNR or uh, environmental protection commission or whatever that agency is in your state to see if you do indeed need a permit to be collecting these bugs in the first place yeah we had someone from pennsylvania write in a note about um permitting and that's something too so especially if you're moving in towards being certified and you're doing the save our streams protocol that protocol requires collecting a large number of bugs um you know, 100 bugs or in some areas you collect 200 and collect them we have them in the net and then we sort them into these trays these cute trays that have water in them so they're on the net for a little bit hopefully we try to get them into water as quickly as possible so they're not you know laying out for too long but absolutely so some states require permitting for that kind of collection um just because you know you're in a stream and you're you're sort of stirring up the habitat um but for other things like our um, the Creek Critters app, which Zach mentioned. So this is a very small scale. It'd be going out and getting one or two bugs to look at them and put them back right away. That's not considered as, you know, a scientific collection on the level of Save Our Stream. So it's definitely something worth, you know, double checking with your state. You can also always email us. You know, we have experience with different states and everyone has different rules. So like Zach mentioned, you know, in Virginia or Maryland or Pennsylvania, the rules are different um, even across regions. Yeah, definitely. All right, so we're gonna move into our last category of pollution tolerant macroinvertebrates. Um, so I kind of mentioned this briefly at the beginning, but <clears throat> just as a disclaimer, um, again, just because you're finding these bugs doesn't necessarily mean that the water quality is bad especially if you're finding some of the, the more tolerant or, or sorry, the more sensitive bugs along with it. Um, these bugs just simply are able to tolerate more pollution than the others. So 
Um, if you're only finding these bugs, that would be probably more of a reason to be alarmed. So here we've got an aquatic worm. These guys can, uh, they can vary quite a bit depending on the species that you find, but they're gonna be just, you know, kind of what you think of with the worm. They're gonna be ribbon-like, long and skinny, no legs. Um, they're not earthworms, so um, we won't count earthworms because they're not considered aquatic. But uh, yeah, these guys are pretty, pretty standalone uh, when you're trying to identify them. They can also be kind of hard to see as well if you've got a net out. So that's again when it uh, can be kind of handy to have that spray bottle. If you spray uh, the surface, the table, or the, or the net that you have them on, you can see them start to wiggle around. And we also have midge fly larvae. And so these guys again are kind of a little bit uh, caterpillar or worm like. They're not going to be long and ribbon like, like the aquatic worms will be. But uh, they've got a head here and they have these pro legs. So if you remember, these aren't technically, uh, they're not technically real true legs, but they're just appendages at the front and the back um, that you can help identify, uh, identify a midge fly using. And they also uh, have these little tufts on their butt sometimes. And they can also be reddish in color. And they're not always red, but um, if you do see the red, that can help you identify them. But the reason they are, some of them are red is because uh, they have qualities, they have hemoglobin in their body that helps them survive in low oxygen environments. So where other bugs wouldn't be able to survive due to lack of oxygen or low oxygen, uh, midge flies can survive. Oh, jump the gun. <laughs> And here we've got black fly larvae. Um, they grow up into just uh, a fly, obviously, I guess, by their name. But they're identifiable by their bowling pin shape is what we call it. They've got this big round uh, bottom of their abdomen, and then it gets skinnier up at the top, kind of like a bowling pin. You think of it gets big, and then it gets skinny at the head. <clears throat> and so that's the same with the black flies. Um, they'll have a dark head. and uh, dark body sometimes as well and so they don't have the don't have any legs or gill tufts sticking off their body just kind of wormy and bowling pin shaped uh, everyone's favorite the leech um, these guys can tolerate pollution as well and they are kind of worm-like. Obviously, they don't have legs, um, but some, a lot of times you'll be able to see their suckers uh, on the ends of their bodies, and they can be really small or they can be really long, but they don't have a really a distinct head, um, like another thing that we're going to look at after this, or abdomen or, or things like that, but they're going to be slimy, kind of similar feeling to an earthworm, and they're going to have a sucker that um, helps them move around and eat and my cat wants to be in the video today. So yeah, you can read here, they don't all suck blood. Um, and so obviously you wanna be careful with any of the bugs that you're handling, but um, you don't necessarily need to be too frightened if you, just because you find a leech doesn't mean it's gonna drain your blood out of your body. You can just pull it off if it does. So here's something that looks kind of similar to a leech. Um, an easy way to tell them apart is the planaria or the flatworms, whatever you want to call it. Um, I just refer to them as flatworms. These guys are going to be really tiny. So you see up to a quarter of an inch. They don't really get any bigger than that. They're just going to be really small and pretty, they're like light gray. And you might be able to see with the naked eye or for sure under a hand lens, but they have these little eye spots and their head is kind of arrowhead shaped. And they also don't have suction cups like the leeches. And I'm, I referred earlier to these lunged snails. Uh, we talked earlier about gilled snails, which will have the opening on the right, but you can remember lung, L, left, opening. So 
Um, if you find a cone-shaped snail, hold it up with the cone with the tip facing up and the opening facing towards you. And if it's on the left, that will be a lung snail. And then if they're these spiral um, shaped snails, those are always going to be lung snails. So we don't have gilled snails that are shaped like this. Um, but the one that can get kind of confusing is these, but they're pretty easy to tell apart if you face the opening towards you. We did have a question come in about the snails and the sort of lung, quote, lunged versus gilled. Um, so lung snails don't have lungs the way that, you know, we might think of. <laughs> you have our lungs, but they basically have the ability to, they go up onto land or onto the surface. They can breathe through the specialized organ and then go back down into the water. And that's one of the main reasons why they're so tolerant of pollution. So if you think of the gilled snails have to, you know, breathe and get their oxygen all the time um, in the water. So when they, if the quality is really bad, then, you know, that will affect them and they're very sensitive to pollution versus the lung snails can sort of escape, grab some oxygen from the air and then keep trucking around. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so you'll often find these in like, or I've I've found them often in like stagnant ponds, which are pretty weedy and low oxygen, but they love it. All right, moving on to our lookalikes or mistaken identities. So if you just look at these pictures and you're not familiar with them, um, you might get these damselfly, mayfly, and stonefly mixed up. Um, but again, I'll just go kind of clockwise here and look at some of the ways to tell them apart. So if you pick up a stonefly, it's going to have a smooth abdomen. It doesn't have the gill tufts, the little feathered gill tufts along the abdomen. They'll often have little armpit hairs uh, under their legs. And these guys will have two tails. Um, but again, make sure you have other features to help identify besides just the tails. And they have these long antennas sticking off their head as well. So then moving down to the mayfly, you can see gill tufts all along the abdomen. Often they'll have three tails, uh, though sometimes they can just have two, um, but they don't have the armpit hairs. They have the gills along the abdomen. And they also, they lack the, they don't have the long antenna like the stonefly do. And then over to the damselfly, they're gonna be, generally they're gonna be longer and skinnier than the other two. Um, they have these big eyes, which kind of sit off on the side of their head. And then they also have these three paddle shaped or oar shaped tails. And this isn't a great picture to be able to see the tails, but if you remember from, I'll just go back real quick. So on the damselfly tails, they're going to be shaped like this and not, not wiry or hairy. Man, we've been through a lot of slides, folks. We're getting close to the end. Hang on. <laughs> a lot of bugs. Yep. A lot of bugs. So here's again our, our lookalikes with the, the big jaws. We've got the Dobson flies or the Helgramites. They have the gill tufts, those little feathery tufts on their abdomen under the appendages. And whereas the fish fly doesn't have those, has the appendages, but no gill tufts. And they've also got these little uh, fleshy tails on the end. An alderfly will be at its maximum size will be smaller than these guys uh, in their maximum size. So, uh, you know, if, if you have a young Dobson fly, it could be the same size as an older alderfly. So don't use don't only use size, but that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, but the alderflies will have the appendages again. Obviously, they don't have the gill tufts under the appendages. And they only have seven, whereas these guys have eight appendages or eight pairs. But you can really tell by the, the tapered abdomen, kind of triangle shaped, and this feathery tail here. And I think this might be a lot, oh, second to last pair look likes. But these are the wormy look alikes. So, um, I'm just going to again go clockwise here. We have the midges, which uh, we just recently talked about the ones that can sometimes be reddish. And they don't have true legs coming off the body. They have these little pro legs. They don't have any, um, any gill tufts or anything on, along their abdomen. And so 
just look for those two little nubs at the end and um, no legs. Then moving over to the common net spinning caddis fly, you're gonna wanna look for these three armored plates, which are really distinctive. Um, and just, if you remember nothing else about the common net spinning caddis flies, just remember these three plates. Um, but they also have these gill tufts on their abdomen and at the bottom of their abdomen as well. And then over to caddis flies, which are sensitive to pollution, <clears throat> or they can also be case maker caddis flies, if you want to call them that. Um, they have soft, fleshy bodies and they don't have those hard plates like the net spinners. And so look above the legs and if they're soft, it's going to be just a caddis fly. And if they've got the plates, it'll be a net spinner. And then lastly, the riffle beetle. This is the one that I always say it looks crunchy. Like I can just imagine if you squished it, it'd make a gross sound. Um, but uh, kind of striped like a raccoon almost, a raccoon tail. And they've got this little tuft at the bottom as well. So soft body all around, no legs, three armored plates, no armored plates, and then full armored body basically. And then we've been over the snails, lung snails open to the left and gilled snails open to the right. So, all right, we're almost done folks. What can you do uh, at home? Or if you want to go on to become a Save Our Stream certified monitor, or if you just wanna get some practice and uh, to work on your ID skills. <clears throat> we, I mentioned the Creek Critters app earlier. Actually, Becca, have we had any questions come in? Since I was... <laughs> we just had one come in. It's a perfect timing. All right. uh, so um, Justin and Liam asked, can case maker caddisfly larvae be found without their cases? Yeah, yeah, they can. They can be found with or without cases. And so it'll be easy to tell if they have the case on their back. Um, but if they don't have the case, then you'll just look for the soft, um, soft body with no armored plates. Yeah, yeah. So they can... Um, the case makers, you know, build their cases as they're not like uh, hermit crabs where they have to change and, you know, crawl from one to the other. But, you know, it could be while we're doing our sampling and there is a lot of uh, disturbance that we do in the stream, so they might get knocked out. Um, an important thing, like we talked about earlier about what counts as a bug, if you find an empty case, that won't count as a case maker. But, yeah, definitely, this is one of those things where once you see them, they'll it it's very striking the difference and those net spinners have very prominent usually fluffy gills um once you see one it'll it'll be in there um, yeah. and in the chat box i've been putting in a few links in addition to our resources that zach's going to go through in a second um that includes some great images online so not macroinvertebrates.org definitely just look at those images because they're really beautiful really high quality um in terms of being able to see what these guys really look like and um you know nothing replaces going out in the field so hopefully you can use some of these resources uh zach's going to discuss to get some practice yeah yeah definitely i mean you can look at pictures on a screen all day or out of a, a booklet but getting outside and getting some practice is the best way to do it so um i was starting to talk about the creek critters app which it's just a free download onto a smartphone um, that we're partnering, Isaac Walton League is partnering with the Audubon Naturalist Society on this. And what it'll do is it'll walk you through, um, basically it's a less involved version of Save Our Streams microinvertebrate sampling. And so you'll just need a net and a container to put your bugs in, or you know if you even wanna just practice with uh, a bucket of water and picking up a rock and rinsing it around in the bucket to see what comes off, you can, you can even do it as simply as that. So um, you can download Creek Critters and it'll walk you through step by step how to do that. Um, you can also visit iwla.org slash water and that's the Isaac Walton League website. And on the left there will be a tab for resources for monitors. And if you open that there are some helpful videos, um, there are instruction sheets, there are some identification keys. So I mentioned earlier we had one if you go to this this page, there's a, an identification key that has all the different bugs laid out on the same page, and you can see the relative size differences. 
Um, so I mentioned, you know, like ripple beetles are super tiny, but you can tell by that picture. So if you see a ripple beetle next to uh, a, craw a crayfish, then um, that kind of gives you some perspective on their sizes. Uh, and you can also just go out and informally just practice your observation skills. So if you're out for a walk or you're playing in the creek with your kids or something, um, just turn over some rocks or pick up a log out of the water and see what's squirming around on there. Um, you'll be pretty amazed uh, to see what's going on in the water beneath the surface when it looks like there's not, you know, a ton of life as far as maybe you don't see big walleye and herons and things like that living in the stream, but you start looking a little, little bit closer, there's a lot of life under the water. We also have a lot of helpful and informational videos on our Isaac Walton League YouTube page. Um, we also, Save Our Streams has an Instagram page and a Facebook page, and we post macroinvertebrate highlights sometimes, um, monitoring updates and things like that. So you can follow us and try to just keep in touch with some of those things. It's kind of an informal uh, way to follow along. And then lastly, there will be a follow-up uh, email after this webinar. So if you've signed up, you'll, you'll get an email either tomorrow or maybe the next day. <clears throat> and in that email, look out for a link that you can fill out or click on and fill out to um, sign up for our online, uh, online Save Our Stream certification. So um, we'll just need, you know, where you're from and maybe your, your email address and some basic info. And then we'll send you a link to take our online exam which will just run through a lot of these same bugs that we just talked about, or all the, all the bugs we just talked about, and just quiz you on your ability to identify them. And if you answer enough of them correctly, then you will be considered uh, completed in your first step of Save Our Stream certification. And there will be a, a protocol exam as well, which we'll, um, we'll be putting out some videos for that on a later date, and then, if you're trying to do this online portion, we'll also be doing, once everything calms down, we'll be doing some half day field days to do the final step of the certification. So uh, we're not gonna be able to certify anybody without actually being out in the field and looking at bugs and going through their protocol together, but you can at least get the first half started, which is uh, all the stuff that we're gonna do online is what we would do in the morning inside a classroom. So this just uh, allows you to skip through that and get to the fun part where we go outside and play in the water. Awesome. We did have a few um, questions about some of the macros come in. So, um, one person just sort of didn't really commenting that he's found a lot of macroinvertebrates in vernal pools, and um, you know, macroinvertebrates can be found in all kinds of different habitats. So, with save our streams, what kind of habitat are we sampling, and um, sort of what kind of habitats do you use this protocol to get a score for? Yeah, that's a very relevant question. <clears throat> and sorry, I didn't mention that earlier, but we are, Save Our Streams works with streams that are three feet deep or shallower. Um, basically, you can use your knee as an estimate. Uh, so if it's if it's knee deep or shallower, then um, those are the kind of streams we'll sample. And um, we do just stick with streams. We don't do larger rivers or lakes or wetlands and things like that just because the the macroinvertebrate population will be different and so our uh, our quality assurance plan is specified to small streams so we can keep our our scores that our different monitors get kind of uh, as similar or keep the procedures as similar as we can between the different places and different people and we have two different kinds of protocol that we use. One is yeah. a muddy bottom stream and one's for a rocky bottom stream. So I, in the Atlantic, I'm much more familiar with rocky bottom streams. So there's two kind of two different kinds of streams you might see. There's ones you might be familiar with that have these riffles where water is bubbling over rocks and there's, you know, rocky bottoms and um, boulders, gravel, things like that. And then there's other streams that are muddy bottom streams and you sample those a little differently. So it depends on what kind of stream you're looking at uh, or what protocol you use. But yeah, we don't sample like in tidal streams that have salt water coming in, things like that. And that's just because the, the calculations that we use are specific for flowing water. 
there are macroinvertebrates that live in lakes, but because the water is still, that means there's going to be different kind of bugs living there. So you might sample a lake and get a really poor score. And that's just because, you know, stoneflies don't live in lakes or things yeah. like that. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say that we'll talk about the, the muddy, bo muddy bottom versus rocky bottom sampling in one of our follow up videos later. Um, mm -hmm. That's another part of our training that we'll go through online. So don't worry too much about that at this point if you're interested in catching mm -hmm. that cue later. Yeah, so in terms of what's sort of next steps and the different tests and whatnot. So typically when we run a training, and of course we're a little bit adaptive right now, there's the macroinvertebrate introduction. We want to make sure you know your bug. Then we also do a water quality and protocol introduction, which walks through what are some water quality questions that we're trying to answer, what are different pollution sources, and then what is the protocol itself. So like Zach said, don't be worried that you don't <laughs> what the sampling entails because that's going to be sort of the next part of our training. So we're going to have follow-up videos and we're working on developing those right now, which will be those other introductions that you would get during the training. In terms of taking the test itself, um, which we had a couple of folks ask about. So when you submit your form, you basically have to fill out that form so we know where you are and make sure you have the resources you need and take that online bug exam. Um, the exam is totally open book. So our goal is to test, you know, can you memorize all these bugs and can you tell the difference? Whenever we go out in the stream, we have lots of identification materials. You're never going to know every bug, everything about every bug. So the tests are open book and you can basically take it as many times as you need to. If you don't pass on the first try, we'll send you it again and you can just keep taking it. So again, our goal isn't to, you know, make sure you've memorized every bug and every detail and can do this with your you know, without any kind of ID material, but can you use all the resources you have available to identify your bugs? I mean, when we're, when I'm out in the field, I still have lots of ID materials with me and I'm always flipping through, flipping through my books. So that's why we also share some other resources that you can find online, you can print out, um, some guides you can purchase as well. Yeah. And yeah. We yeah. also had a question yeah. about where what we do with the data. Um, Zach, can you sort of, generally talk about if folks become certified and they're collecting their data where that goes yeah yeah so we have a website called the clean water hub it's just www.cleanwaterhub.org and that's a nationwide water quality database that we're working on um, growing it's ready right now so you can put your data in there if you're certified but um yeah we we have data from macro and sampling from all across the country in there. Right now we have a huge concentration in the mid-Atlantic area where Rebecca works and um, in the Midwest area where I am. But cleanwaterhub.org will lead you to that database if you're interested in checking it out. And if you're also interested in just doing um, chemical monitoring, we have resources for that is on our website, which um, you wouldn't need to do any sort of training or certification to do that, but that produces valuable data as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll put, I'm going to put my email and Zach, I'll put your email as well in the chat box too, in case you are in the Midwest or in the Mid-Atlantic and you're looking to reach out um, with some specific questions, we can definitely answer those. So I'll put those in the chat now. Perfect. Yeah, just to make sure I got all the questions here. Do, do, do. So also with the data, um, another question is, who uses the data and who can use the data? Well, it's a publicly accessible database, so anybody can go to the Clean Water Hub and look at the data that's that's near you or in your state or, or whichever area you're looking at. So um, if you're interested in, you know, getting a spreadsheet of every monitoring event and every result, we'd have to send that to you via email because you can't download that off the website right now. But anybody can access it, you know, if you're you want it for your personal reasons to know what's going on in the stream in your backyard or if you want to present it to the city council or soil and water conservation district or something like that uh, any citizen can do that um, i know rebecca maybe you want to talk about what virginia does with um basos data over there yeah sure so the 
Virginia is pretty remarkable. They are a, one of the states that's like the gold standard for using citizen science data. So the data that we collect in Virginia and actually um, also in the Chesapeake region, the Chesapeake watershed, that is sent to the state and also is provided to the um, EPA project, which is the, the Chesapeake Bay project. And so the state of Virginia uses our data that citizen scientists collect to track progress um, of restoration programs, to keep an eye on streams and target streams for further follow-up. You know, if we have monitors that report a sudden decrease in stream health score, uh, the Department of Environmental Quality will go out and follow up on those scores. So um, this is really powerful data that we collect. And so this is why we have this training that folks are required to go through and have these exams is to ensure that um, you know this this stream data is really high quality and can be used by by all these different um, by all these different groups. And definitely um, feel free to keep an eye on our website um, on our workshops page and our webinars page, and we'll reach out with once these our next um, trainings online trainings are scheduled because we'll go into a lot more detail about the program itself um, during those trainings. So if you have specific questions about you know the protocol and background and water quality definitely keep an eye out um, for those presentations because that's where we'll really go into it um, versus chatting about the macroinvertebrates themselves yeah yeah and we can also <clears throat> we'll probably also post about those on our social media so you don't need to check back every day necessarily if you don't want to but if you follow us on social media we'll also probably announce those yeah, we'll try and we'll try and cover every communications platform other than uh, driving through your town with a loudspeaker. Yeah, <laughs> we did have um, so a question about timing, and I'm not sure if this is about. So we'll answer both for bugs and sampling because I wasn't sure which. But someone asked, "Does time of year matter?" Um, Zach, do you want to take about time of year and when people sample? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we recommend that you don't sample any more than twice a year. <clears throat> just because you know if you come in every month or four times a year you're going to be disturbing the habitat and um, potentially negatively impacting the very bugs that we're trying to get or trying to look at and so we recommend twice a year once in the spring um, and once in the fall so you know March to May is usually our our time that we look for in the spring and then if you want to go September through end of October maybe even early November in the fall but in the summertime uh, the bugs are often under a little bit more stress when it's warmer and there's sometimes less water in the streams and so we don't want to necessarily go in and and cause them any more stress if we can help it yeah and in terms of the bugs themselves um yeah some of them hack at different times again it, we can make there some general uh comments but different species and different genera hatch at different times, but right. So typically in the winter time, their bugs are not gonna have, not gonna be hatching. And we also, we actually don't wanna go out and sample right when they've hatched because they're teeny, teeny, tiny. So in the summer, a lot of them are hatching like late spring or in the summer. So if you go out in the summer, the bugs might be <laughs> extra, extra tiny. They are still macroinvertebrates, but they can be very little. Um, and so that's why we try in the spring and fall is to try and hit them when they're going to be bigger rather than just when they hatch. But all these bugs, you know, they hatch at different times. Um, but for the most part, they're going to be hatching when it's warmer, um, of course. And, you know, the bugs themselves are only be laying eggs once they're able to be up and flying about. And um, I think we've got a few, um, one or two more questions here, and then we'll wrap up for now. Um, of course, definitely email that email that Zach has right there goes to all of us. So if you have any further follow-up questions, we're happy to work with you. Um, Drew wanted to know if you, you know that macroinvertebrate or other wa water quality sampling is being done, um, is it still valuable to collect this data if you know it's water quality sampling is being done in your area? Yeah, um, <clears throat> oftentimes, especially like state agencies they have limited resources to um, be able to sample twice a year at the same stream site every year so you know i don't know where this question's coming from geographically but oftentimes 
there will be years in between sampling events uh, during state surveys. And so that's just a value of citizen science is that we can monitor more often in in more locations when we when we utilize our our citizen science um, methods to do that. Um, but again, I would also try to uh, contact your your local agency or your state agency and see if anyone is monitoring whichever area that you're that you're looking at trying to sample or or that that's in question because we don't want to be uh, sampling twice in one year or affecting their results. And so uh, try to try to coordinate with local and state agencies in that in that aspect so you're not affecting their results um, and vice versa. Yeah, and also even if you know um, stream is being sampled, it doesn't mean that's being sampled multiple places along the stream. You know, they flow past all kinds of things. So I live quite close to a pretty urban stream called Sligo Creek, and there are there's a cited to where it's sampled, but of course it flows past houses and under highways and through parks. And so even a single waterway really ideally should be sampled all along its length. So you can really get an idea of what the water quality is like throughout, a, throughout the stream's life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, our guidelines say to, to, if you're wanting to sample along the same stream to have your sites be at least a quarter mile apart. So if this if this letter S here if this letter S here was a river or a stream that you're interested in sampling, and mm -hmm. it, it had a tributary coming in right here, maybe you'd want to sample just below that tributary and see how that uh, water quality coming in is affecting the stream. And then there's another river that adds onto it down here, maybe sample below that tributary. So there's definitely value to sampling the same water body in multiple places. For sure. That was that was great. That was an excellent visual. Description. And yeah, I was gonna say again, you know, keep an eye out for our next um, training presentations because we'll absolutely, you know, discuss some of this stuff in more detail. And um, yeah, we should be. We're planning in the next few weeks to be able to line those up. As you can imagine, it's been a pretty dramatic shift for us of going from scheduled in-person trainings to moving online. So. We're glad to be able to, to reach out with all of you and hopefully uh, be able to provide provide this information and then get folks certified eventually. Yeah. All right. Well, that is all the questions I see from my end. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for sending those in. It's always a lot easier to have these presentations be a little more interactive, um, be a little more conversational for sure. So. Yeah um keep in check that chat box for some of the resources i sent out as well as check on our website for um some more macro and details yep and keep an eye on your inbox we'll be sending out a follow-up email after this with some some other links and if you're interested in trying to take that macro invertebrate exam that'll lead to a form to get you registered for that yeah great well thank you zach for taking us through the macros um, like I said, the recording should be headed your way um, tomorrow or the day after. Feel free to reach out to us with any questions. And definitely, um, if you haven't already watched some of our previous webinars, you can view our previous webinars on our YouTube channel, which I put the link in the chat box. And keep an eye out for our next webinars coming up. So, for example, next week we're going to have a discussion about using safe streams for local change, for local government. Um, some of our folks, especially if some of you are asking about what can we do with this data, this is gonna be a great a great discussion for you. And we'll be providing these webinars for the, for the foreseeable future. So keep an eye on our website to uh, see which ones are coming up next. Yeah, thank you everybody for joining. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, thanks, Zach. And uh, hope to see you all at our next webinar. Yeah.